exalt you, Lord. We praise you in this place, Lord Jesus. There is no one like you, Father God. Thank you so much that you have called us to be leaders in your kingdom, Lord, to be your ambassadors, Father God. And we thank you for what you've done in our lives, Lord. Thank you that you have set us free. And who you have set free is free indeed, Lord Jesus. And we thank you, God, that you are still working in our lives. You are not finished, Lord, and you will complete the work that you have started in our lives. So we surrender to you tonight, Lord, and we say, come and have your way in Jesus' name. We, you deserve all the honor. You deserve all the praise and all the glory. Let's give God one more shout of praise in this place. There's no one like you, Lord. You are so, so good. Thank you, worship team. You are awesome. Isn't it just so good to all be gathered together at our small group leaders gathering? So tonight we have our small group leaders from George and Muscle Bay and Park Dean all together. Of course, we can't have Matt Diesel here ministering and not call everyone together. And then Vintuk is leaning in, so ha hello to everyone there. And also a big hello to all our small group leaders from Hope Family in Mongu and Hope Family in Northwest Arkansas. We want to encourage you that you can take notes tonight, but you can also know we're going to send you a PDF of all Mads' notes. So sometimes for me it's easier to lean in and afterwards get the notes and to try and take notes and uh, focus, but feel free to take notes if that works for you. But just so you know, you'll get a full PDF with all the notes. Thank you, Mads. We appreciate that. And you, you're more than welcome to move and find another place to be seated where you're going to be more comfortable or see more clearly. So... I don't want to delay any more, but I want to welcome Mads up onto stage. <laughs> Who's heard Mads preach before? Most of us. And we're so excited to end the year strong. And we know we're all going to leave here better and stronger than we were we came in. Thank you, Mads. We appreciate you. Thank you, everybody. Please be seated. I love being here. This, this is like home away from home for me, and so it's always an honor, it's always a privilege. And I'm really excited to be speaking into a space that I think many of us may find ourselves struggling with, potentially at different stages and seasons in life, but we, always, we, we often don't quite know what to do with these dynamics. And I wanna speak into the space of safeguarding weariness <clears throat> but understanding the hooks of codependency. And um, I know if the enemy can't stop you from becoming a Christ follower, he's gonna do everything in his power to burn you out. And uh, the dance of codependency is quite a complex dance. And I think we all exist somewhere on the sliding scale of it. And uh, even as I prepare this, and uh, I'm actually writing also into the, I'm busy writing two books at the moment, just because, you know, you can. <laughs> but but uh, the book I'm writing now is called The Power of the Pigsty, and I'm going to touch on it a little bit as we go through tonight's notes. But you know when you're writing and you go, oh, that's me. Oh, that's me too. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> you know, I love what Paul said earlier about wanting to see people healthy and whole. And that's the goal of what I want to be speaking into tonight, is to give you tools that when we journey with people in discipleship, when we journey with people in our small groups, that they're not coming into our church, into our small groups, um, and turning 120 times. Did that land? Because you don't go to school and stay in grade one for 20 years, do you? And it shouldn't be like that in church. We should be maturing. <clears throat> and often we don't always know how to journey with people into maturing. And so I really want to speak into that space. But I want to first of all just share about the five stages of dependency. And this hopefully come up on the slides. I've got quite a bit slides, so I'm going to need you to track me here. The five stages of dependency. 
appreciation for the first time, anticipation for the second, expectation by the third, entitlement by the fourth, dependency by the fifth. These are the five stages of dependency. And if you keep tying your kids' shoelaces when they should be learning how to tie their shoelaces, you will tie their shoelaces for the rest of their lives. It's that dynamic. If you do it the first time, it's thanks. Then anticipation, will you do it? By the third time, it's an expectation, an entitlement, and then I'm dependent on you for this. And so I think it's important that we understand that there is a codependent dance that can happen Often when we find ourselves in the role of caring for others, in the role of sowing into people's lives, and I want to unpack this, but I want to first of all show you where hooks of, are often kind of pulling us in, especially when a person's in some kind of a crisis. And I came across the four phases of disaster when COVID hit, and I did a bit of study into this space because... At any stage in life, we can find ourselves or others in a disaster. And often when a disaster hits, the first stage that we find ourselves in is what is known as the heroic phase, where you literally drop everything and run to help. This can be if there's a pile up on the freeway, this can be when COVID first hits and everybody started finding pieces of fabric to make masks, do you remember that? The early stages, you know, it's like anything to make a mask out of, old sock, or whatever it was. Um, and so it generally lasts a couple of hours, maybe even a couple of days, but your output in terms of your normal life is zero because you're in just rescue mode to help in the midst of the crisis. Then we shift out of that into what is known as the honeymoon phase. And this can last a couple of days, weeks, maybe even months. This is when meal rosters get put together and schedules of visiting or helping. So you kind of go back to some normality of work, maybe 60, 70%, but there's still a high, high output of helping those that are impacted most by the disaster. But at some stage, people start to shift into what is known as the disillusionment phase. And the disillusionment phase is the phase where those who are helping start to feel the burden and the weight because their resources, their capacity, their, um, their, their just time starts to diminish because we've got to get back to normal life. And we don't have the capacity to keep giving the way we have been at that high level of output. And then you get those that are still impacted by the disaster who start to feel rejected, abandoned, disappointed, that you're no longer able to give the way you were giving. And so this tension emotionally starts to happen between these two groups of people, which is why it's called the disillusionment phase, because there's the sense of, I just don't have any more. I remember watching a movie many years ago called The Beach. Anybody seen that movie? With Leonardo DiCaprio. And it's about him being this tourist and there's this kind of um, secret map that's going around of this exclusive beach that most people don't know. It's kind of off the beaten path and everybody wants to go find this beach because it's just perfect paradise and there's you know, not many tourists there. And so anyway, he finds a map, he gets there and it is, it's perfect. And there's a small community there and because they're disconnected from society, they've got a few rules of their own. And in the journey of being there, one of the guys on the beach gets bitten by a shock. And obviously there's no hospitals, there's no medicine. So in the beginning, everyone's in the heroic phase. Everyone's there, everyone's concerned. And then they start to create schedules of somebody tending to him, giving him water, food. And then Leonardo wakes up one morning and he can no longer hear the cries of this guy that's been bitten by a shark. And he runs outside and the guy's not where he was. And he says to somebody else on the island, like, where, where is he, you know, has something happened? And the guy said, no, we moved him to the other side of the island. And he asked why, and he said, because we just want to get back to playing volleyball on the beach. And I remember that scene hit me so hard because often that's what it's like. Everyone's there, 
and the gossip of the crisis, because it's, it's exciting. But when the pain of someone's troubles lingers longer than our capacity, then we start to yearn for the normal of just going back to playing volleyball on the beach, because I don't want to deal with the tension of someone else's distress. And it's interesting to note that generally people move from the disillusionment phase to the reconstruction phase at the, at the anniversary of a disaster. Normally a one year anniversary is when people start to realize, hey, things ain't changing. Things aren't going back to normal. If I don't adapt to my new normal, then I will stay stuck. But I wanna speak into this disillusionment phase because how do we manage that space well where we feel the expectation and at the same time we've gotta manage our capacity because if your output exceeds your input, your upkeep is your downfall. Some of your minds are going, huh? <laughs> if your output exceeds your input, your upkeep is your downfall. When a child is born, they are 100% dependent on you. And they are 0% responsible. Our job as a parent is to shift those percentages. To teach them to become responsible. I always say to my boys, my job is that one day your wives say thank you to me. That's my job. <laughs> <clears throat> Moms of boys, you know what I'm talking about. I want you to cook, clean, sew, you know how to do it all, that your wives thank me. But I want to give a definition of a codependent relationship. Codependency is a learned behavior that can be passed down from one generation to another. It is an emotional and behavioral condition that affects an individual's ability to have a healthy, mutually satisfying relationship. It is also known as a relationship addiction because people with codependency often form or maintain relationships that are one-sided, emotionally destructive and or abusive. I know there's some pretty strong descriptive language in that, but it can vary from a sliding scale perspective of intensity. And generally, it doesn't start off with a level of intensity, but it can often grow into that space. It's a proverbial frog and hot water dynamic. So how does the role of codependency birth? Where, where does it start? And it'll generally start in some level of dysfunction in a family dynamic. If there's an addiction, if there's a mental illness, if there's a trauma, whatever the dynamic is, that's often the birthplace. And what happens is you can start off where a parent is irresponsible or they are distracted by their own crisis. And a child is in that dynamic. That child often steps up into a responsible role because of the irresponsible parent. That child then grows up and becomes an incredibly responsible adult whose level of responsibility is incredibly high to the point where they take the responsibility even of their children's responsibilities, which then births an irresponsible child who grows up and becomes an irresponsible parent, breeding a responsible child. Can you see how the generation cycle repeats itself? I am a responsible parent. I was a parent to my parents, and I've caught myself many times picking up responsibilities of my children that do not belong to me, even to this day. The fascinating thing is that often the responsible parent marries an irresponsible parent, and it's the beauty of the codependent marriage and the codependent parenting dynamic which can also filter into codependent friendship dynamics and work colleague dynamics. I counseled the lady who told me she goes on leave often in order to finish the work of her colleagues. Codependency at an extreme for burnout. <clears throat> and so I wanna speak into the roles of this dance 
because I think it was Craig Grishol who said, you cannot defeat what you haven't defined. And it's important that we define these hooks and pulls in ourselves so that we can become more consciously aware of them. Because long term, if you stay in these kind of roles, it will lead to bitterness and resentment and burnout. And one of the things I'm passionate about is that we safeguard longevity of calling. And calling doesn't just mean those who are employed full time for the church. <laughs> Calling is that I am a follower of Christ, called to serve the body of Christ. Yes? <clears throat> so let's look at the difference between the codependency roles. And we have what we call the giver-rescuer role and the taker-victim role. Generally, the giver-rescuer role is somebody who is selfless, takes responsibility very highly, often has no boundaries. They struggle to show their own needs. And the reason why they struggle to show their own need is because if they were a child to an irresponsible parent, to show your need to somebody who's irresponsible would just result in disappointment. So we learn to hide our needs. Long term, they can often feel used and bitter, but there's a part of them that needs to be needed because it gives them a place of belonging. And they tend to be too busy with everyone else's stories to actually consider their own. The taker victim role, they tend to be seen and experienced as being selfish, dependent. They won't recognize other people's boundaries. Their need will tend to take priority. They can tend to show little care for others because they need to be rescued. Their story benefits them because then they don't have to take responsibility themselves. But if you go a little bit deeper into these roles, there are actually wounds, and it's important to identify the wounds, because the wounds are what keep us stuck. If I don't reveal where the wound is, how do I ever get to a place of fully healing in that space? So let's look at the wound of the giver-rescuer role. They often believe that it's their purpose. If you've been in the responsible parent role from the age of 10, it's very easy for that to move into your gifting, to your responsibility, to your calling. There was a, 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 a guy, I'm trying to remember who it was that wrote the book called The Shadow Missions. Someone Google quickly the book Shadow Mission, find me the author of it. Um, but he wrote about the shadow mission, which is when the enemy wants you to operate in the shadow of your gifting to a distorted version of it, knowing that it can hook you to a place of destruction and burnout instead of staying in the light. Does that make sense? And if your identity is wrapped up in your purpose of being highly responsible and you slip into the shadow of it, it will be a, a slippery slope into burnout. Anybody find it? Who was it? What was it? John Ortberg, that's the guy. He wrote the book Shadow Missions. He's quite a few uh, talks he does on it. It's a really interesting talk. The giver rescuer role is so ingrained that responsibility belongs to them that they will struggle to see the difference between what actually is theirs versus what belongs to somebody else. That need to be needed is what helps eliminate the fear of their own worthlessness because their value is intertwined in what they do, what they can offer. And if I am needed, then the possibility of rejection decreases because somebody else needs me. If I am not needed, the possibility of rejection automatically becomes higher. I remember a season in my life where I was burning out because of this, I noticed that all my friends were younger than me. I was the big sister. And it's a quick way to do a snapshot of where are you in terms of relational health? Does everybody need you? Are there people in your world that you can lean on? And somebody who is a rescuer will struggle to show their need because of the fear 
of being rejected. The fear that their need is too much. If your own biological parent can't look after it, how can somebody else? So there are a lot of fear wounds behind that space. For the victim taker role, the wound is often entrenched in an inadequacy. And why should I start now is the deceptive thought. Because this works for me. I've never had to tie my shoelace before. Why should I bother bending down now and learning the skill? But there's a fear. Because if you're on the soccer field and you see all your buddies tying their shoelaces and you don't know how to do it, there's a shame that can come upon you around your inability to do something for yourself. If you do for a child what they should do for themselves, what you're speaking to them is, I don't believe in you that you have the capacity to do this. The fact that I'm doing it for you means I have no faith in you. And so it creates a deep shame, a deep inadequacy. And instead of dealing with the shame and inadequacy, it's very easy to play the blame game. Well, it's not my fault, I can't, you didn't teach me, it's your fault that I have this mess. And it's easy to play the blame game because if I can get you focused over there, then you don't have to look over here. And these are the dynamics and the dances that keep people stuck. Because the more I am rescuing, the more the other person will allow themselves to be rescued. And this is the destructive dance. So what is the difference between codependency and interdependency? Well, codependency involves dependence on another to the point where it negatively impacts their lives. Codependency is an unequal partnership that puts one above the other. And interdependence, indepe sorry, interdependency involves sharing roles but not being so dependent on another person that you lose yourself. It requires both able to operate autonomously with mutual support for each other in the independent goals and responsibilities. You know, human beings are fascinating things. I love watching all sorts of reality shows just to get into the mindsets of dysfunction. Like, that's my learning ground. Anybody, sometimes my husband's like, why are you watching the Kardashians? I'm like, well, that's my, no, that's my nothing box, you know? Men have nothing boxes. I'm joking. <laughs> are you also watching Kardashians? Um, but um, <clears throat> human nature, as I said, fascinates me. If I were walking in a desert with another human being, and it was a three-day journey to the next oasis where we could find water. And this was the only bottle of water that we had between the two of us. The person next to me had finished theirs because they didn't consider the journey, and I had this left. There would be three strategies that the person next to me would use to get water. The first strategy is flattery. You're such an amazing friend. <laughs> Kind, sharing, generous. I so value your friendship. Am I right? If that strategy doesn't work, they will use the next one, which is called manipulation. I thought you were a Christian. I thought it is better to give than to receive. And if that strategy doesn't work, they will kill you for it. <laughs> it's humorous, but it's true, isn't it? Because that's human nature. We have thirsts. And our thirst is to know that I'm loved, that I have purpose, and that I have value. And if the thirsts, the wells that I turn to are not quenching my thirst, then I will hunt for it to the point of even killing whether I destroy a relationship, whether I destroy a person's life, a career, my own potential and future. And people perish because of a lack of knowledge, often in this relational dynamic. But because it's sometimes slow, <laughs> we, don't, we don't see the dysfunction happening often until it's too late. 
And I want to speak into the complexities of how do we, how do we empower people to unlock ownership, to become responsible, because I think ownership is a word that's very unpopular. <laughs> no one wants to take ownership. It's so easy to just blame rather. And we see that even in Genesis, you know? Who told you to eat this fruit? Well, Lord, it was the woman that you made was the blame excuse. Can you have a double blame there? It started in Genesis, so this is not new. This is part of our human nature. So how do we unlock ownership? Well, I want to first of all speak into the mindset of the difference between a, a victim and a victor. Because it's important to discern the difference in the two mindsets. Because one wants to get well, even though they may be a victim to circumstance, and the other doesn't. And it's important to discern the difference between the two because you can pour your life into a victim only for you to be drained because they don't want to get well. So how do we discern the characters of a victim? Well, Scripture's not as politically correct as I am being right now because Scripture doesn't call them a victim, it calls them a fool. Proverbs 19, verse 3. People ruin their lives by their own foolishness, and then they're angry at God. So one of the characteristics is that they're a blamer. Proverbs 12, 15. Fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. In other words, they're unteachable. I shared this with my son when I was trying to show him a different approach to a math problem. And he wasn't interested. So I said, you know what the Bible says in Proverbs 12, 15? <laughs> and so he looked at me and he was like, his brother looked at me and goes, ha, you're a fool. <laughs> and he wasn't happy about that one. Proverbs 18, 2 to 3, fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to air their own opinions. They're often self-centered. Proverbs 26, 11, as a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats its foolishness. They're indiscernible. The four words I have there is there are blamers, they're unteachable, they're self-centered, and they're indiscernible. B-U-S-R. Fools are too busy in their destructiveness. And fools will keep you busy in your rescuing if you don't discern. Okay. One of the quickest ways I can discern if a person is a fool is to give them homework. Now, I know homework's a very negative term. So let's just say we give them a scripture to reflect on or a question to chew on. A fool will always have a reason why they didn't do their homework. The dog ate my homework, or whatever it is. So what is the biblical wisdom for dealing with a fool? Proverbs 23 verse 9 says, Don't waste your breath on fools, for they will despise the wisest of advice. There comes a time where we have to stop talking. And there are times where people say, hey, can I meet you again for another session? And I'll be like, sure, did you? And I'll meet them and I'll say, so tell me about you know, the, the reflective work I gave you and there's a reason why they didn't do it. And, and I'll give them another opportunity and then they'll phone back and I'll, then I'll say to them, so tell me, how did it go with the reflective stuff I gave you? I haven't done that yet. Well, when you have, call me and I'd love to meet you. So you start putting in boundaries around, I will walk with you as long as you are walking with yourself. Make sense? If you are walking ahead of someone in the journey, you are owning their workout. You see, the enemy wants you to believe that Philippians 2.12 says, work hard to show the results of your neighbor's salvation. Paul, is that right? That's not how the scripture goes. Whose workout do we do? 
our own. I can go to, to the gym, show you how to use all the apparatuses there, but I can't do the workout for you and you get the results. I mean, that would be great. I mean, I'm still looking for an instructor who will do that for me. Phone them up. Can you work on my abs? You know, I'm going back to sleep. But scripture says, work hard to show the results of your salvation. But many of us are doing other people's workouts. And we're getting weary for their workout. And that, that word workout means katskazima in the original Greek, which means to do that which shows a result, to do something to which therefore shows the result of the workout. We can't do other people's workouts, otherwise we will get weary. I love the story found in John chapter 5 where Jesus heals the man at the pool of Bethesda. He'd been sick for 38 years. If you consider how many meals was brought to him, if he only had one meal a day over 38 years, it's over 16 and a half thousand meals that somebody had to make. If you times that by two, two meals a day, breakfast and dinner, that's over 32,000 meals a day. How's that for a roster of disillusionment. Sometimes people don't want to get well because it's working for them. Jesus asked him a very powerful question. The question was, do you want to get well? For somebody that's healthy, it's going to feel like a weird question. If you're sick just for three days, you want to get well because you want to get back to contributing to society. Do you want to get well is what I call an ownership question because an ownership question demands an ownership response. Because some people don't want to leave the well because it works for them. They don't want to leave the pool of Bethesda because it serves them. I don't have to work. I don't have to cook for myself. How many moms would love that? <laughs> Not have to think about what to cook. And so I've got a list here of ownership questions because they're empowering and it pulls people into considering their responsibility in the journey. A question like, what role have you played in getting here where you are right now? Can you see how that shifts you away from the blame game into the ownership perspective? What role have you played in your own story? I've counseled people who are bitter in relationships because they gave everything. But if I just say to you right now, you can all come up to me afterwards and I'll give each of you a hundred bucks. How many of you would not come? <laughs> you would all come, right? And then if next week I said the same thing, come, I'll give you a hundred rand. It's, and then two months later, I'm broke. Whose fault is that? I've counseled people who have blamed those that have taken from there for them living in poverty. And I'm like, well, if you keep giving, someone else is gonna keep taking. And you can't be angry that somebody took. You have to own the fact that you kept giving and giving until there was nothing left. So what role have you played in your relationship that has brought you to a place of having nothing left? Because it's very easy to blame the other. What do you have control over versus what don't you have control over? You see, often when we're frustrated with a person taking for us, then we want to shift gears into trying to control them so they don't take anymore. But a taker doesn't want to be controlled. So what do you have control over? Well, in my home, I have control over the Wi-Fi. <laughs> I can say to my kids, I need you to do your homework, and they're like, no, I need to finish this game. 
You see, our needs are at different spaces. And then we feel powerless, don't we? No, you need to do it. No, I don't need to do it. So I will release the Wi-Fi to all those who are responsible with their homework. I have control over the Wi-Fi. I don't have control over you. But I hope you have control over you because if you want to get control of the Wi-Fi that I have control over, you better manage yourself. You see the power dynamic? But people will come in and go, how do I change that person? No, you can't. But you can take ownership of you. What choices can you make to start moving forward? What is keeping you stuck that you need help with? How have you overcome problems in the past? What wisdom can you apply from that to now? How can I best hold you accountable? You have power in these questions. What narrative are you telling yourself that is unhelpful? And what do you believe is the truth according to Jesus? There's a scripture in James that says, if you have trouble, you should pray. But often we think that the prayer of the pastor is more powerful than the prayer of the person with the problem. And so it creates this codependency. I need you to pray for me because I can't. Often when I minister in churches now, I'll say to them, I want you to ask God to give you a revelation of truth to the lie that you're struggling with. I'll just pray that God speaks to you. But you talk to him. He's more interested in hearing from you than me. It's your problem. Am I right? Now please hear my heart. I'm not saying it's wrong to pray for people. But at the same time, I want to empower people to know how to pray. It's not wrong for me as a mom to cook. But at the same time, I want my boys to have the skill set of knowing how to cook for themselves, especially when I'm sick in bed and I need them to cook for me. <laughs> it's empowering. A few months ago, I was speaking at a church up in Pretoria, and my boys asked if they could run my resource table with my books, because I've got a Yoko machine now, and they love the Yoko machine. So they said, Mom, can we be your booksellers? I'm like, sure. <laughs> I'm a little nervous, because I know how easy it is to put an extra naught in there. <laughs> but I came out of the church, and I saw them at the back, and man, their, their faces, their chests were out there, they were marketing my book as though they were the editors of my book. This is a really, really great resource. You, you should definitely, and buy this one. You, you have problems with your marriage? Definitely buy this one. <laughs> okay, no, they didn't say that, but it was close, okay. And I was like, you haven't even read this book. How do you know it's so good? But what I loved about it is that sense of empowerment at the age of 10 and 11, they're running the resource for me. I mean, they wanted a cut of the money at the end. They're good little marketers. But that sense of seeing them come alive because they took ownership of something. And that's what I also love about this church is, is the heart of Paul and Marinette. They love to empower people with spaces because that's where maturity happens. That's where growth happens. And my encouragement is to take that model and sow it into every dynamic of what you do. Hey, why don't you lead the ministry in our small group tonight? Oh, I've never prayed out loud. You know what? Even if you just say, love you, Lord. Thanks for loving us. Great. It's a great start. Whatever it is. Empower people to take ownership of their journeys. Luke 15, verse 7 to 22 is the story of the prodigal son. <clears throat> I often imagine to myself, and I'm writing about this, the conversation that happened between the father and the son. Hey, Dad, um, I've got this incredible business idea. I've got these mates of mine. We've been talking about it. It's foolproof. Bitcoin is up and to the right. It's, it's going to guarantee that we double our finances in a very short space of time. Hey, my boy. There's no quick route to making money. 
no, Dad, you, you seriously are so out of touch with the trends nowadays. You really don't know what you're talking about. And so let me just warn you, your friends know that you've got a big inheritance coming to you. That's why they're friends. Dad, you don't know my friends like I know them. Hey, my boy, no, Dad. Hey, my boy, no, Dad. Eventually, the dad stopped talking. When I was studying in this, it was fascinating that the dad actually gave his son his inheritance. There was a deep insult that happened in that moment because basically the son is saying, I can't wait for you to die before I get my money. And in a sense, it shows to us that God is willing to turn us over to our foolish ways. Because there's power in a pigster. So the father let him go with his inheritance. And at some stage, the son found himself in a pigster. But there's a sentence that is shared right before Luke 7, 15, verse 17, where it says, and when no one gave him anything. So I imagine in the beginning of his journey with inheritance, he had a lot of mates. It's on me, guys. I'll get this round. I'll get this meal. Give me the receipt. I'll pay for this bill. And everybody loves that, don't they? Till eventually there was nothing left. And when there was nothing left, I imagine that he went knocking on all the doors of those that he had paid for. And maybe they gave him a couple of bucks here, a meal there. And we don't know how long that space was till the point where no one gave him anything. I wonder how long that time period was. You know when that someone phones you and you know exactly what the phone call's gonna be about? It's another request. Or there's people that you haven't heard from in months, sometimes even years. And then it's like, hey, I've been following you on Facebook. You're doing so amazingly. Miss you. There's the flattery. <laughs> Is there any chance you're able to give me? And you know it's coming. Until the point where everyone's so used to the dance, the story, the manipulation, that no one gave him anything. Then verse 15, sorry, chapter 15 to verse 17 says this, when he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home even the hired servants have food enough to spare, and here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son and embraced him and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. You see, the father never brought him KFC in the pigsty. Because if he did, he would still be there. It was only when the pain of his choices was impacting nobody else but himself that he came to his senses. And when you read the other two stories where this story is found of the prodigal son, you've got the lost sheep, you've got the lost coin, and you've got the lost son. And in the lost sheep, the shepherd goes looking for the sheep. And in the lost coin, the woman goes looking for the coin. But in the lost son, the father doesn't go looking for him. And I wondered why. And then it dawned on me because there's a big difference between being lost and leaving. And when we leave, we have to get to a place where we come to our senses in order for us to come back. And I believe this world 
is still in a place of grace. Do you know why? Because the whole world is a pigsty. And the pigsty is where we realize that when I try and do things in my own strength, it's messy. The pigsty reminds me that I don't have to do this alone, that I need to go back to my father's house, that it's better with him than on my own. You see, the enemy wants you to live in self-sufficiency where I don't need the Father. He wants us to depend on what we've inherited, which is the knowledge of good and evil. Because the enemy says, if you eat this fruit, you can become like God. And if you believe you're like God, then you don't need God. I just need myself and someone else to feed me and to keep me in this place of self-sufficiency. God wants us to come back to him. And the power of the pig star, we see the son mentally own it, physically own it, and verbally own it. He said to himself, talking to yourself is biblical. Just don't do it out loud in an elevator. <laughs> People will think you would. But he said to himself, then he returned home. He walked home. And lastly, he declared it, Father, I have sinned. There was a repentive heart of owning his leaving. And so he came back. Now, it's incredibly hard to see someone you love in a pigsty. And this is where that codependency gets hooked. Because when you see someone struggling in the pain of their choices, our rescuer hearts want to take that away from them. And that's where we have to hold our ground sometimes. I love you, but right now you have to go through this experience because that's the consequences of our choices. We often think that if God forgives us, he's gonna take away the consequences. And I've taken away my boys' iPads plenty of time and they'll quickly come back going, Mom, I'm so sorry, you're right, that was wrong of me. And they know how to own it. Can I play again? <laughs> sorry. And it's that pain of like, but I said sorry. I'm like, I know that, but there's still a consequence. There's still a pigsty moment that will hopefully be a teachable space of realizing it is better to follow wisdom. It is better to follow truth. It is better in my father's house. Does that make sense? So we've got to hold those places, and I know it's hard. It really, really is hard. But I think if we keep getting into pigsties, then we keep robbing those teachable moments that potentially can bring someone back. And please also again hear me, there's a big difference when someone's in ICU versus someone is repeatedly stepping out of God's will, of God's wisdom, of God's ways. And this is where we've got to use wisdom. And there are times that we may need someone else to journey with in terms of what do healthy boundaries look like? So how do we own our own rescuer's heart if that's something you struggle with? And this is something I've had to work on myself over the years. And first of all, it's just investing in your own value foundations. The more you understand that what you feel matters, the more you allow yourself to share those feelings with others instead of just living yourself in self-sufficiency. Do you know the only other time the word wretched is used in scripture is in Revelation, where Jesus called a church wretched. And the reason why he called that church wretched is because of their wealth, because of their eye cream, and their will. They had an incredible resource of wealth. They had some formula of making this great eye cream and wealth. And he said, you're wretched because you are poor, blind, and naked. The opposite of the very thing that they were finding their dependence on. And part of our journey of healing is realizing that my value is not based on what I do. My value is based on who Christ says I am. That if I say no to someone, because I'm putting in a healthy boundary, it doesn't diminish my value. 
I love the fact that Jesus only healed one at the pool of Bethesda. That's liberating for me. Most people would set up a hospitality ministry there and then burn out. Jesus only did what the Father told him to do, not what the need demanded. We have to safeguard longevity of calling. I don't want to burn out. I want to finish this race well. So sometimes that means practicing saying no. And one of the beautiful tools I teach people is, my heart would love to, but my capacity right now just can't. And that's true. Most people's hearts never want to say no. But if you judge your heart by your no, you will end up burning yourself out. And don't judge somebody else's heart by their no. And then lastly, to consider, what am I picking up that doesn't belong to me? What am I carrying for someone that they could be carrying themselves? Am I doing for somebody else what they should be doing for themselves? And these are just simple questions we can ask ourselves in the sense of the boundary of am I rescuing somebody because I need to be needed? Or am I in fact empowering somebody to take ownership of their journeys? And you can apply these tools to your children, to your spouse, to people in your small group, to family members. Family members can be the hardest because it's well entrenched. Patterns of behavior have been learned. But you always, can you hear the dependency on that? Let's go, well, I'd love to. And I've counseled many people who've struggled to put in boundaries for family members. And generally, to bring change needs at least a three-month period of consistently doing things different. Because you see, most people can change or manipulate their behavior to appear as though they're getting well for at least two months before their real motives are exposed again. It's the reason why most rehabs say you need to go for a minimum of three months. Because generally your true behavior starts to reveal itself in month three. So these are the kind of boundaries that we need to consistently put down. And if you've never put down a boundary for someone and you do it for the first time, I can guarantee you they will ramp up their manipulation, their flattery, because they are trying to see how strong your boundary is. And so often things do get worse before it gets better. But the more you just hold your ground and you go, I love you, would love to, my heart would love to, but right now I just can't. And we safeguard those spaces. Because our role as leaders is to see other people grow into leadership. That we're not creating codependent where I need you to be my leader for the rest of my life. No, next year there needs to be double the amount of people in this room. Because leaders have raised leaders into maturity. Is that cool? So I wanna pray for you. If you are feeling weary, if you are struggling with a relational dynamic, whether it's at home, small group, at work, doesn't matter where it is, even if it's with a kid, where you've gone, man, I've been doing, I've been tying their shoelaces for three years longer than I should have, whatever the dynamic is. I'm gonna ask you to be brave and stand. And the only reason why I want you to stand is because part of the healing journey for a rescuer is to be able to say, I'm tired, can someone pray for me? And it's hard to expose your need when you've always been looking after other people's needs because it's a vulnerable place. So I'm not gonna ask you to do something that I haven't done myself. I remember it's a few years back and my Renette can vouch for that, I actually created a group and I said to a whole bunch of women, there are times when I'm traveling that it gets lonely and tiring. And that's where the enemy wants to clap me the most, when you're in those quiet spaces and there's no one caring for you, no one checking in, how are you really doing? 
I said, so this is a vulnerable place for me to invite you in. So if I'm struggling, I can say, hey, please pray, I'm struggling. And it's scary when you're used to doing the giving and not the asking. So that's why I'm asking you to do a brave thing. If you are tired and you want someone to pray for you because you're so used to pouring out, but it's a scary place to be receiving, will you be brave now and stand with me? Thank you. And I just want to just put out your hands in a posture of surrender. Because God wants to restore what locusts have eaten. And so, Father, I just lift up every person in this room who is in this place of just weariness and burnout, maybe even despair, hurt because they have felt betrayed or used or manipulated. And Father, right now, I just pray first of all that you will just fill each person with just a deep revelation of how much you care for them Lord, you said that we can cast our burdens onto you because you care about us. That we don't have to take the care role forever, that you care for us, that you are a rock that we can lean against in our time of weariness. That we don't have to carry the burdens of others because we can cast those burdens onto you. And so, Father, I just pray for an infilling of your Holy Spirit, for that peace that Paul spoke about earlier, to fill their hearts and minds with a sense of knowing that you are in control, that you've got this. For those who are in fear of family members or friends or someone that they love deeply, and they're seeing that person in a pigsty now, and they're feeling the pain of that place, Father, won't you stand next to them as they look and wait for their prodigals to come home? And Lord, we know that the good work you start in us, you bring it to completion, that you are doing a good work in those prodigals right now, bringing them to their senses to come back home. And Father, I pray for a comfort of your Holy Spirit as we sit watching and waiting with the pain and the distress of seeing those we love struggling in pig stars. And where there is weariness, Father, I pray for rest, exponential rest, that when we sleep, it's a declaration of saying, you are in control. You don't slumber or sleep. You watch over us day and night. And we trust in your goodness as a good father. And so, Father, just restore right now. Thank you, Jesus, for your healing, for your restoration. And, Father, I pray lastly for a greater deposit of your wisdom as we put healthy boundaries and power others to grow in the fullness of what you've called them to. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All oh, God's people said, amen. I just wanted to let you know, I got to speak at the Ark Conference a few weeks back on the guarded heart versus guarding the heart. And I uh, turned that talk into a version Bible reading plan that came live a couple of days ago. If you're struggling from a heart perspective because of others that have maybe betrayed you or wounded you or you're burdened and you're tired because of people dynamics, we're complicated, not you guys, but others out there, you know. And it's easy to become guarded. And scripture says, guard your heart. In other words, not become guarded, but be careful what takes root in it. Guard against bitterness, guard against being jaded and burdened 
because out of that will determine how you live your life. And we've got to manage our heart space as well. Yeah. So if you're struggling, it's there on you version and just a great resource to be able to unpack maybe just some triggers that may, you may be struggling with when it comes to your heart. Okay. Blessings to you all. Wow.